On behalf of the Shalom Hartman Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Edward Bronfman Family Foundation Annual Lecture on Religious Pluralism, the public lecture of the annual International Theological Theology Conference. Our Muslim, Jewish, and Christian conference participants are here tonight with other guests as well, and you're all very welcome here. We at the Shalom Hartman Institute see this setting as an opportunity to take a break from the conference schedule and topic in order to share thoughts and ideas about pressing, it, pressing, it, pressing issues, I, ideas which in the last three years have led to major projects at the Institute. Tonight's topic is From Crisis to Covenant, Rethinking a Narrative for Israel. This evening, is dedicated to the memory of Rabbi Dr. David Hartman, who we remember and miss here tonight. David wrote that a mature appreciation of our liberation struggle requires that we recognize the mixed blessings that freedom and power bring to Jewish living. He asked, how do you build a Jewish society when there is no significant consensus as to what is normative in Jewish history, nor any agreement about the sources out of which to build new norms. He struggled with the balance between the Torah's challenge that Israel become a holy people and the fact that we're not immune from the normal weaknesses and failures that affect every human being. When I was growing up in the United States, while Jews disagreed about almost everything, Israel was something that brought Jews together. Jews collected money to support Israel, rallied in Washington or at the UN for Israeli causes, sang popular Israeli songs, and prayed for the new Jewish state. In the past decade or two, however, things have changed. Jews don't only disagree about Israel. They yell at each other. They call each other names for daring either to criticize or support the policies of the Israeli government. Three years ago, the Shalom Hartman Institute began to develop I Engage, a series of educational materials um, which attempt to shift the discourse about Israel from arguments about the conflict to something richer more thoughtful, and more complex. But we realize that this is not only a Jewish problem. Jews who criticize Israel, Israeli policies risk being called self-hating Jews. But Christians and Muslims are often labeled anti-Semites for expressing such sentiments. A year ago, a group of Christian academics and clergy were brought together to conceive and create a version of I Engage for Christians, which we call New Paths, Christians Engaging Israel. I've had the honor, pleasure, and challenge of working with the teams of both I Engage and New Paths, and our speakers tonight are also deeply involved in these programs. To my left, Yossi Klein Halevi, journalist, writer, and senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute, and to my right, the Reverend Dr. Peter Pettit, professor at Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania, um, and um, co-director of um, New Paths, Christians Engaging Israel, um, and a long time, I, I don't even know if I can call you a fellow, more than fellow, <laughs> at the Shalom Hartman Institute. Um, so we be, we'll begin, um, each of our speakers will speak for um, about 30 minutes, and then we'll open for questions um, and more conversation um, more broadly. So, Yessi. Thank you, Marcy. Good evening. It's wonderful to look around this room and see some uh, old friends. Randall, very nice to see you. Humaira, Abdullah, wonderful to really see some, some very cherished friends, and to be on a panel with you, Peter, is, is a real joy. So I, I have to begin by confessing to a certain unease about the, uh, the title, From uh, Crisis to Covenant, 
And as part of the uh, Engaging Israel team for the last three years, this is an unease that I've been expressing on a regular basis in, uh, in arguments with uh, some of my, uh, my co-members of, uh, of our team. And my, my unease with, with the formulation is that it seems to me to be too pat, it's too neat as if we can shift from being in a crisis mode to being in a covenantal mode in terms of our relationship with the diaspora, our relationship with ourselves, with the Israeli story. Crisis is built into the Israeli narrative from our very origins as a state. And by crisis, I don't only mean the existential physical threats with which Israel has had to contend from its inception. Um, physical threats that are intensifying as the Arab Spring collapses around us and as Iran moves toward nuclear, nuclearization. But there is a deeper crisis, no less existential to my mind, that Israel faces, and that is the crisis of legitimacy. And there's something that for me is, is <coughs> frankly appalling uh, in that the more that we become rerouted as a people in this land, the more that one generation of indigenous Israelis follows another, the more our very indigenousness is being called into question here. And it seems that there's almost an inverse relationship between the success of Zionism in re-indigenizing the Jewish people and the legitimacy to which that process is being repeated, is being increasingly called into question. And that is a situation that, that I see as, as an ongoing existential crisis and a crisis that is intensifying. Israel is the only country that has to justify its existence, uh, the only country uh, whose policies uh, are, um, are invoked in uh, not just it to, to condemn, to condemn uh, Israel, but to really uh, judge its, its very right to exist. And so, in this formulation of moving from crisis to covenant, as important as it is for us to strengthen the covenantal aspect of, our, of the diaspora's relationship with Israel and of our own relationship here with, with, with ourselves, I, I fear that there is in this formulation uh, almost a, an understandable attempt to evade the unbearable nature of, uh, of our crisis of legitimacy. Nevertheless, where I, where I do deeply connect to the engaging Israel approach of strengthening covenant is that a Crisis mode is no basis for a long-term healthy relationship with Israel. That's, I think, increasingly clear. I've just returned from a three-week lecture tour uh, in the United States, primarily in Jewish communities. And the crisis mode for all of its, for all of its inadequacies is simply not working. That perhaps, in some sense, is the most devastating critique one can offer. The crisis mode has failed. It has failed to, to engage a new generation of American Jews. And even as Israel's crisis, its objective crisis intensifies, the fact that we have depended, that we have defined our relationship with diaspora Jewry for the last 60 years on the basis of their support for our various crises, has brought us to the point where the, where the crisis itself uh, has become depleted, no longer, can no longer appeal to, uh, to, to the sense of urgency on the part of many diaspora Jews. And the truth is that if you look at what's happening in Israel today, we're at a moment, a, a, to my mind, a very precious moment in Israel's political evolution and our maturity as a polity, in which there is now, at these, these very days, 
a revolt against the crisis mode and a longing for a covenantal politics uh, in, in our own system here. The fact that uh, Netanyahu still cannot uh, create a government one month into uh, past the elections when uh, he ran virtually uncontested and and it seemed at that during the at, at the period right after the elections the assumption was that he would simply have to pick and choose uh, and he could create virtually any kind of coalition that that he wanted and Netanyahu is very much uh, focused on creating uh, what he calls an, an Iranian coalition, a coalition that really will be dealing with the Iranian threat. And yet there are parties today that are in open revolt against the crisis mode of Israeli politics and are insisting that we deal with long festering and long neglected domestic issues, whether that is the, the so social crisis, the economic crisis, the growing disparity between rich and poor, the crisis of the middle class, the, the abnormal relationship of the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox minority to the mainstream. These and other issues are now being forced to, to front and center of Israeli politics, and there we really see a shift from the crisis mode to an attempt to replace that with a more covenantal politics, relying, examining the, the, the question of the relationship of the state, the responsibilities of the state to its citizens, the responsibility of one group of citizens to another group. And this really is an expression, an attempt to create a covenantal politics. And that, that began two years ago with the unexpected eruption of the social protest movement. I'm sure some of you read, or perhaps were even here, read about the, the tent camps that uh, sprang on uh, Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv and all over the country. And um, it was really an extraordinary proliferation of, uh, of, of a domestic-driven politics, which is something that we, we experience very rarely here. And my daughter, Moria, who was uh, very involved in the protest movement uh, at the time, put it to me in the following way. She said, my generation is now the third generation after the Holocaust, and we are tired of living under the shadow of existential threat. We want to live in a normal country. And my response as her father was, well, that's all well and good, but let's look at reality. And nevertheless, I, I really uh, thought, thought much about uh, that, that longing that Moria was expressing, which I think is very much characteristic of her generation, to be freed from the crisis mode and in effect to replace that with a covenantal relationship. If we here in Israel are feeling the limitations of, uh, of a crisis-driven politics, then that's all the more, tr more true in terms of the diaspora's relationship with Israel. A healthy relationship between Israel and diaspora Jews requires a partnership, a partnership that that would be based on shared values and not only shared anxieties. And the truth is that we've never had a real partnership with the diaspora. We've had slogans, the old slogan, we are one. And yet, if you examine the history of this relationship, it was always based on the assumption that the role of American Jews is either to cheer us on or to support us in times of crisis and that we have very little to actually learn from each other's culture, from each other's values. And the relationship has been deliberately focused and in a sense nurtured on, uh, on, on crisis. The defining moment in the American-Jewish-Israeli relationship occurred in 1950. At that time, the U Israel's UN ambassador, Abba Iban, made a speech urging young American Jews to pack up 
and move to the new state of Israel. And the head at that time of the American Jewish Committee, uh, Jacob Blaustein, was outraged and he felt that Abba Iban's call was an, a, a, an attempt to undermine the, the sense of belonging of American Jews to their, 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 their country of birth. And Blaustein flies to Israel on an emergency mission and seeks out Ben Gurion and they work out what becomes known as the Ben Gurion Blaustein Exchange. And the basis of that exchange is that Israel will not call into question the Americanness of American Jewry, or for that matter, the national identity of any diaspora community, certainly not in the West. And in exchange, the diaspora will support Israel in terms of its economic needs, absorbing immigrants, and certainly in terms of any political support that Israel would need in times of crisis. Now, if you examine the basis of the Blaustein-Ben-Gurion exchange, it is based entirely on a utilitarian relationship. There, is, there isn't a hint of any sort of of, of exchange, cultural exchange, that perhaps American Jews might have something to learn from the new Hebrew culture, the new Hebrew civilization that was being created here, or that we here might have something to learn from the Jewish experience of creating pluralistic institutions in, uh, in the United States. It was based entirely on what we will do for you, and in turn, Israel, agreed to respect the Americanness of American Jewry. We will not question your American loyalty. But there, isn't, but there is no sense of interest or curiosity about the Jewishness of American Jewry. And that really remained the model for all of these last decades. Uh, Israelis have been notoriously um, uh, atum, 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 uh, obtuse. Uh, in, in, that's, uh, it's, it's, you, you even have to think of obtuseness in Hebrew. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of a lack of, of the most basic curiosity of the kind of, of Jewish life that's been created in, in, uh, especially in recent decades uh, in the United States. And, uh, and, and for their part, American Jews have really confined their interest in Israel to, uh, to politics. So you have the AIPAC model of supporting whichever Israeli government is in power. And now you have the J Street model, which is more critical of, of, uh, of right-wing governments <coughs> in Israel. But both AIPAC and J Street are premised on the same approach, which is our relationship as an American Jewish community to Israel is really entirely confined to politics, to the Palestinian issue, other issues, and not to the kind of cultural developments that are being created here. Our friend uh, Micha Goodman recently had a, a I think of an important observation. He noted that for the last 2,000 years, Jews nurtured two longings, Jews in the diaspora. The first was to be accepted unequivocally by their neighbors, and the second was to regain national sovereignty. In our time, both of those longings have been fulfilled. The first longing has been fulfilled most most fully, one can say, in, uh, in the American <laughs> diaspora, where Jews are not only accepted as individuals, but accepted as a, a Jewish collective, where Jews can define themselves as Jewishly as they themselves seek to, without the society imposing restrictions uh, or, or, their, or society's own definitions on their Jewishness. And here, of course, we've regained our national sovereignty and for the first time have, again, the opportunity of shaping a sovereign public space. And these two communities have much to learn from each other. And the way that, that, 
the model that I have in terms of, of when I conceive of a kind of cross-fertilization between American Jewry and Israel, it is between one community that is expert at width and another that has access to depth. In the United States, American Jewry, is, American Jewry can create and experiment with various forms of Judaism. So for example, feminism has now fully entered non-Orthodox Jewish denominations. You have other experiments that have taken place in, in recent decades. And, and in the same way that America is, is, has that sense of almost unlimited expanse, which always amazes Israelis, just that you can get into a car and just drive and keep going. Uh, in that same way, you have that, that capacity for, for cultural experimentation. Uh, in Israel, we have access to the depth of Jewish history. Now, both width and depth have their own shortcomings. Their depth, width can, can sometimes be a little thin, a little superficial. And depth, the depth that we have here very often seems to me uh, the a kind of a, the metaphor that, that comes to mind is of a, of a well, which is narrow and dark and deep. And Israel and Israeli Judaism often seems to be very narrow, dark, and deep. And so in a, in a healthy relationship between the diaspora and Israel, one, one could conceive of a, of a, of a transfusion of, uh, of both depth and width, a sense of expansiveness that we here desperately need, and a sense of depth which American Jewry often lacks. And the good news is that I think that at least here, we are beginning to pay attention to some of the experimentation that's happened, that is happening in the United States. And uh, my friend and colleague, Rani Yegar, here at, uh, at the Institute, who is one of the founders of an egalitarian, non-Orthodox prayer group that meets in the summer months at the Tel Aviv port called the Beit Fila Yisraeli, uh, was inspired to create a place of egalitarian prayer after attending uh, services in Manhattan's B'nai Jeshurun. Uh, some of you may know it, BJ, as it's called, where on a given Friday night, you could have upwards of 2,000 young people singing and dancing and bringing in Shabbat. And Rani went to services at BJ, and he said, well, why can't we have that in Tel Aviv? So there is the beginning of, of a, uh, a cross-fertilization. I would hope that American Jews would be paying uh, more attention to some of the new Israeli music the Jewish spiritual music that's being created here, which is uh, increasingly profound. Uh, some of our leading rock musicians are turning their attention to, uh, medieval, to the medieval prayer poems of uh, Ibn Gvirol and Yehuda Halevi, the uh, piyutim, the, the, prayer, the prayers of, uh, of uh, North African Jewry. You can turn on the radio today, and then along with the, the usual pop songs, uh, there's Ibn Gvirol, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's an extraordinary transformation of parts of the Israeli culture. And um, my hope is that this will begin to, to infiltrate in the other direction. Now, do I have much uh, more time than we have? Another 10 minutes? Now, some words about the political divide the growing political divide between large parts of the diaspora and Israel. Jews today are increasingly divided along two perceived existential threats. One is external, the other is internal. The external threat is what I defined earlier, the, the sense of, of, of enmity uh, closing in on our borders, Iran a little farther away, but nevertheless feeling quite close. And the internal threat that more and more Jews, especially in the diaspora, are, are sensitive to is the, the 
growing danger to the stability of Israeli democracy, the ongoing occupation, the sense that the occupation is becoming permanent uh, as, the, as the possibility of a two-state solution recedes. And to my mind, both of these threats, both of these existential anxieties are not only legitimate, but must be placed on the diaspora Israeli agenda. And one way to conceive of that is that we live with, in, in a sense, with two impossible dilemmas. On the one hand, we are the only democracy in the world that is also an occupying power. And that is untenable in the long term for democracy. On the other hand, we are the only country in the world, some of whose neighbors have marked it for disappearance. And so we live with those two impossible dilemmas and if we are to create a healthy conversation between Israel and the diaspora, we need to acknowledge the, again, the legitimacy, the urgency of that full conversation of, our ex of the existential threats that we face externally and internally. A healthy people, I believe, would prioritize its existential threats. And to my mind, the external threats that we're facing are, are are possibly imminent. The internal threats are incremental and more long-term. But a healthy people would not only prioritize, which is to say, place more immediate attention on the immediate existential external threats, but would not use those existential threats to suppress a conversation, an internal conversation, about the long-term threats to democracy and the threat of occupation to our, to our being. So we need to prioritize but not suppress the, the internal existential threat. Another way of conceiving our dilemma is that we are at once Goliath and David. Compared to the Palestinians, we are the Goliath. If you widen the lens and you take in the Middle East and farther regions, then we become the David. And I think that, that many Israelis experience this conflict with a kind of a split screen in our, in, our, in our heads, where on one side we are Goliath and on the other side we are David. That's also perhaps why it's often so difficult for outsiders to really understand Israel, because this really is a place of, of impossible paradox. The, the deeper clash, though, between these two fears between, the, the, between Israel's anxiety for its physical survival and the diaspora or the liberal parts of the diaspora's anxiety for Israel's spiritual survival is that we are debating not only our fears but also our values. And it seems to me that Jewish history is speaking to our generation with two, in two voices, two almost biblical commands. The first is to remember that you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And the message there is don't be brutal. And the second biblical command to our generation is remember what the tribe of Amalek did to you when you were leaving Egypt and you were attacked unprovoked. And in Jewish mythos, Amalek represents the genocidal threat that periodically rises up. And the message of that command to remember is don't be naive, don't be a fool. Know that you live in a world in which genocide is possible. And so we live at the meeting point in this generation between those two commands. Don't be brutal and don't be naive. Both of those are voices that we urgently need to listen to and absorb. And the tragedy of a, of, of, of a dysfunctional, a dysfunctional diaspora-Israel relationship would be one in which the diaspora speaks in the voice, in the commanding voice of remember that you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and we respond by invoking the remembrance of Amalek. The diaspora needs 
to take our existential physical threat seriously, we need to hear their reminder of the commanding voice of Egypt. And so those are some of the directions, perhaps, that when we conceive of a new covenantal relationship between Israel and the diaspora, those would be some of the components that we would need to address. Perhaps the, uh, the final point would be how in a covenantal relationship would diaspora Jews criticize Israel? And here I will invoke uh, my, my teacher, my, my, my rabbi, my friend, David Hartman, who said uh, not long ago uh, to liberal diaspora Jews, criticize us like a mother and not like a mother-in-law. And, and I, 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 I hesitate to invoke that because I personally have a wonderful mother-in-law uh, who criticizes as a mother if she criticizes at all. Uh, nevertheless, I think that the, the challenge for the diaspora, for liberal diaspora Jews, is not to replace one immature narrative of Israel with a new immature narrative. In other words, not to move from an Israel that can do no wrong to an Israel that can do no right. What diaspora Jews need to develop is a nuanced understanding of Israel. And our challenge is to learn as Israelis to respect the integrity of the diaspora, to appreciate especially the, the ethical sensitivities that Jews living in the most pluralistic country in the world have, uh, have finally honed, and to s learn to celebrate the diaspora as an essential part of Jewish experience. Thank you. Thank you, Yossi. Um, we now turn to Peter. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Yossi. Welcome to all. And thanks to the planners of the conference, myself not included, um, who extended to me the invitation to be here. Um, we gather this evening in David Hartman's uh, honor, following his death and in the midst of extending his legacy in a session that is dedicated to him and from my perspective as well, to the courage and curiosity with which he embraced in particular two Christian partners in dialogue in shaping the conference that now provides the setting for this lecture series. Paul Van Buren and Christer Stendhal. All three have graced this dais at one time or another, and I cannot hope to equal any one of them but I have learned from each of them about texts and study and narratives. From David, I learned, read carefully and stand up to a text. Don't be overwhelmed by it. From Paul Van Buren, I learned to take seriously the use of language and the consequences of its use. And from Christer Stendhal, I learned to stay close to sacred texts. They are wrong less often than you are. So Yossi, as I consider our topic for this evening, and I realize uh, that when Daniil Hartman first approached me with information about I Engage and the possibility of opening a, a Christian wing of the project. I looked through the materials, I watched some of the videos, and my first response to him was, Daniil, this is fantastic stuff. It resonates wonderfully. And the way you've done it would never fly in North American Christian settings. And I think one of the things that we'll hear as I move on is a deep resonance in uh, what it is that we bring to our understandings and the substance of the work, and at the same time, a very different style of putting it. Some of that is simply because the North American Christian world in which I work is very different in its experience of Israel and its awareness of Israel um, than obviously the Israeli world in which you work and the North American Jewish world. Um, 
As for what else might underlie that, um, I'll leave that to others to consider. I appreciate your um, caution about uh, not moving existentially from crisis to covenant and leaving behind any awareness of crisis. Um, crisis is reality. And I would agree that in addition to reality, we also must consider the narrative that we bring to frame our experience and discern a response to the crisis. I recently was shown a wonderful t-shirt ad from a catalog by my wife. And the t-shirt has three lines of text on it. The first line says, let's eat, comma, grandma. The second line says, let's eat, grandma. And the third line says, missing commas can kill. I'd like to use two texts from the New Testament that replace commas or reset narratives and see how they might help us deal with the crises that exist and that are sure to come. Two texts, one in which Jesus writes and one in which Jesus reads. And I believe I'm correct that these are the only two texts in the New Testament in which Jesus does each of those things. One in which he writes, one in which he reads. First, the one in which Jesus writes, John, the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter. Now I'll read the text for you. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach him. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, were commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? They said this so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. The woman's story is already over when she's brought to Jesus. Caught in adultery, made to stand on display, silent, nameless. She is devoid of any personhood or agency. She's an object to be judged. And that, not even for the sake of her own fate, but as a ploy to trip up Jesus. So when they ask him to judge her, this object, and even provide him with the Cliff Notes justification, hint for what his answer should be, Jesus drops away from them to the ground and writes. We have no idea what he writes, but he writes. And when they press him to render his judgment on this object, he turns not to examine it, but to address them. How is she different from you? And bends to write again. They go away. Then Jesus stands and this time addresses her as a living being, another person with sense and memory and experience. And as no one is left to judge her as an object, Jesus sends her on with her life. 
Whatever he wrote, he rewrote the narrative in which he engaged her crisis, lifted her from object to living subject, subject to life's stresses and strains, temptations and trials, callings and calamities, and encouraged her life toward obedience and righteousness. The narratives I hear in North American Christian circles about Israel too often reduce it to an object to be judged. A few examples. Not so much anymore do we hear about the object rejected, the impossible object that has been erased permanently from history except as the launching place of the faithless wandering Jews although its tropes and echoes still form a kind of background radiation from the formation of our culture. Nor so much anymore do we hear about the bellwether object in the narrative of Christian end times expectation to be filled up with Jewish bodies until the fullness of the homecoming brings the fulfillment of history. More often now, Israel's the object of some affectionate attentions in the narrative of American Christians seeking divine blessing through Israel's well-being. Often, too, in the narrative of the Shoah as the epitome of virulent, ineradicable anti-Semitism that renders Israel at once the protective object of Jewish haven and the targeted object of the hatred that takes aim with nuclear warheads and delegitimizing invective. And often, the object of offense in one of the last chapters of the colonialist imperialist narrative of expropriation and exploitation. Choose your narrative. Make your judgment. You know what's been written. How will it read when projected onto this object? For good or ill, blessing or bane, judge the object and rest assured that you've set it in its proper place in the cabinet of your worldview. Perhaps we need to drop down from the badgering for judgment and rewrite the narrative. We need to restore a subject, a living entity, complex and contrary, not so different from the countries where we live. Homelands, Bilada, Patriae, Heimaten, Ratzot, Berso. The places where mongrel societies with checkered histories aspire to fashion futures with promise and hope and prosperity where they struggle against their baser elements and strive to rein in their unhealthy appetites. To see Israel in its crises and beyond its crises as just such a complicated community. For us as Christians, do we not read in our scripture that the paradigmatic people of God, Israel, our forebears in the faith, were brought to such a land, a land of promise and hope? And does God not assure them that despite and forced exile and self-inflicted scattering, there will be return and restoration and renewal? Does the covenantal promise not include landedness, this belonging to a place so that exile is never permanent? Does not the promise of return always follow on the threat of dispersion? Now, one Christian narrative stretching forward through the millennia reads the crisis of Jewish exile in a particular way. The biblical story is torn in two, passing the judgment of exile on one people while settling the promise of restoration on another. And in that division, the people judged came finally to be deemed unworthy of any place on earth and separated even from life itself. We've struggled as Christians for nearly 70 years to make sense of that insensible reading and its damning consequences. 
So unless we choose to read the biblical story again that way, does there not remain in scripture written for our instruction a landed promise for the people Israel? When God creates a people, God provides enough space in the world for that people to live out its national life in sovereignty, in safety, and in sufficiency. Is that not the gospel of the promises to the ancestors announced in the prophets and celebrated in the writings? Comes with a calling to be sure. And there can be consequences for falling short of that calling. But ever with the indictment comes also the promise of restoration and an eternal patrimony secured by the divine word. And it comes with real borders in the real world. I find it fascinating and meaningful that the testimony of scripture will not sit still long enough to make any particular borders definitive. Those seem to be left to historical contingency and human negotiation. Defining human borders is part of the calling, apparently. But we should expect no less of a living entity that lives before God. And we cannot reduce that living entity to a mere object of judgment. We cannot imagine that the ongoing life of the covenant is once again ours to declare over and done and dead. No, these bones have been joined once again. And what God has joined together, let no man, human, put asunder. The breath of life has been puffed into them and jangling into history. They make their way as well as they can through the same troubled, conflicted, challenging, seductive, distracting world that we do. A covenant community hoping against drought and praying for rain. There will be moments of crisis, but Israel is not an object to be judged even in those moments of sharpened rhetoric and high contrast moral vision. It remains a living community with whom we're called to live together before our God. If we can rewrite the narrative from momentary crisis into eternal covenant, any chance that we would render a judgment of death will go away. And the other text, Luke 4, 14 to 30, where Jesus reads. Filled with the power of the Spirit, Jesus returned to Galilee from his temptation in the wilderness, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding territory. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on Shabbat, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you'll quote to me the proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you'll say, do here also in your hometown the things that, you, that we heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. 
There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, led him to the brow of the cliff on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The people of Nazareth thought the story was already over when Jesus had read the scroll. Healing, restoration of sight, freedom, good news, jubilee, all fulfilled as they listened to this remarkable local boy made good seated in their midst. But as they murmur their approval and register their amazement at his gracious words, Jesus provided a bit of context replaced a comma, supplied a parenthesis, held up a mirror of scripture, and reflected back a picture in which the story comes out differently. Because God's story in the Bible is not only about a paradigmatic people of God, it's about Syrians and Zarephathites and Syrophoenicians and Samaritans and Ethiopians and Philistines and Arameans. For just as the paradigm of a divine covenant of landed sovereignty, sovereign self-expression for God's people is written as Israel's history, so also it includes a testimony about non-Israelites among the people, even among King David's ancestors, and about other nations living next door. The Deuteronomistic history that has Israel simply and violently displace those neighbors ends badly, while the prophets of God voice their dignity and narrate God's care about them. Are you not like the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Arameans from Kir? Do we think Israel is unique rather than paradigmatic? Did we forget that Israel is a kingdom of priests serving God's presence in the world, and a holy nation set apart as a model of God's will for the world? Have we lost the sense of Israel called in Abraham to be the one in whom all the nations of the earth will find their blessing? And scripture doesn't seem to care when the Ethiopians gained their identity or whether the Arameans were really so different from the Moabites or how long the Zarephathites had been without any sovereignty of their own. They are, each and all, a people of that time, and that puts them on God's map. Because when God creates a people, God provides enough space in the world for that people to live out its national life in sovereignty, in safety, and in sufficiency. Is that not the character of the God who has called Israel? So, as Amos reset the context of Israel's national narrative in the 8th century BCE, Jesus resets the context of the good people in his synagogue in Nazareth in the 1st century CE. He opens up the possibility that another nation's blessing may be a work of redemption by the God of Israel, the God that the church also worships. That other nation, too, is called to faithfulness and obedience and faces consequences for falling short. That nation, too, is called to negotiate borders that make real God's will for each people to live with sufficiency and safety and sovereignty. That nation, too, lives in the complicated and contrary realities that make national life the muddle that it is. A mongrel society with a checkered history aspiring to fashion a future with promise and hope and prosperity, even as it struggles against its baser elements and strives to rein in its unhealthy appetites, hoping against drought and praying for rain. 
There will be moments of crisis, but even in those moments of sharpened rhetoric and high contrast moral vision, the Palestinians are not an object to be judged. They remain a living community with whom we are called to live together before our God. If we can rewrite the narrative framework with which we enter the situation from momentary crisis into eternal covenant, any chance that we would render a judgment of death will go away. A few concluding remarks. The we I speak of here is the Christian community of North America, the one in which I live and work and to whom I most often speak. While I hope that my reading is faithful and may be a useful witness to Israelis and Palestinians, to Jews and Muslims and Christians here, I know that it cannot be the same as any of their readings or voices. I constantly seek to understand more, to hear their readings, to fashion mine and refashion mine in light of what I learn from them. That, I think, is the calling of a global church in a pluralistic world. And a vital implication of that calling is that I read and speak as a North American Christian from my place and knowledge and discernment also. If instead I become merely a megaphone set to the voice of any of the tribes of Israel or Palestine, then I will have abdicated my particular calling. Even in the New Testament, it isn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Paul who defines the gospel in the church, but the Holy Spirit working with all their testimonies collectively today in the living community of faith. I cannot enforce my, region, my reading, nor abandon it in deference to another's. I can only bring my reading as faithfully as possible and offer it to our shared community. Further, the ethics that would derive from this recontextualizing of the narrative from crisis to covenant lie beyond my scope and time this evening. You'll be happy to hear that. They form a significant focus of the project on which we're embarked in new paths, Christians engaging Israel. I can say that they also will be as plural as the church is in North America, and that they must be written in the first person for implementation in the North American setting where this perspective is grounded. They must also honor as much as possible the diversity within Israel and among its neighbors that is evident to any honest and thoughtful observer, including diversity in moral character and in aspirations for national self-expression. Finally, though, I believe that our Christian narrative regarding Israel must take its lead from what is said about Jesus' reading and writing. It must insist on Israel's living character and complex reality as a democratic Jewish homeland and equally extend the same dignity to the other people seeking national self-expression in their homeland of Palestine. Scripture teaches that God makes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the same on all people. And in the same way, our gaze of common human solidarity must fall equally on Israel and other peoples. We believe that God has reached into our respective lives specifically and distinctly with the life-giving word. And we must find ways to offer that same life-giving word appropriately into the particular situations where we're involved. To do otherwise is to jeopardize the gracious covenantal foundation of our own faith and life as a Christian community. It would deny our Bible's testimony to the oneness of God and of the gospel and cut ourselves off from the root that sustains us. If a missing comma can kill, Imagine the devastation if we once again faced a crisis with whole books of the covenant tossed aside. Thank you.
um, phrase your thoughts with a question mark at the end, okay, and keep it relatively brief. Um, that will then enable um, our speakers to respond more clearly um, to those questions. So um, we'll we'll take a few a few questions and comments, um, or we'll just there's one hand up in, in the back. Svi. Um, there, there are microphones. Yeah. That might help if you can just come forward to a microphone. Is the microphone is it working? Yeah. Thank you very much for the very uh, provocative and insightful uh, uh, schema for thinking about a new paradigm. But uh, my question is directed to uh, um, Peter. Yes. No. Yossi. 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 To Yossi. Yossi Kleiner Levy. You presented what Israel could learn from the pluralistic model of American Jewry. My question is, how so pluralistic? In the Jewish community in North America, not to speak of Europe, the Orthodox and the liberal branches do not do things together. They simply have the freedom to be what they are because they're living in a democratic society which protects them from each other. They really don't confront each other. So they're not a model for pluralism at all. Whereas in Israel, the Jews are living together and have to, and they can't avoid one another, let's say, because they're sharing a the government, they're sharing the public space, they're sharing budgets and so on. So I just, it's a question why you would want to present the North American community as a model for Israel to emulate. They're at each other's throats. Well, let's, uh, let's rephrase that in, in the sense that they are a model for us in their ability to create uh, new forms of Judaism, to, to conceive of the past as, as, as a source of, of inspiration that then leads us into, uh, into creating uh, our own expressions of Judaism collectively. And I think that that's, that, that what American Jewry in particular, uh, the gift that American Jewry has given Israel, many Israelis, is the courage to, uh, to claim Judaism for themselves. And the fact that, uh, that this institute was begun by a, uh, a North American rabbi, I don't think it was a coincidence. And this institute has been an incubator for, uh, for exactly that kind of, look, call it diversity, if not pluralism, uh, to, uh, to empower Israelis to, uh, to take Judaism back from, uh, from the Orthodox establishment. For many, for many decades, we were, we were trapped here in a, a kind of uh, pact between, the, between secular Zionism and the Orthodox establishment. Secular Zionism uh, was concerned with building the state and it ceded Judaism to, to the Orthodox, and it was a very convenient relationship for everyone. Secular Zionism has effectively collapsed as a, as a, as a vibrant ideology, as a substitute religious faith for most Israelis. And so there's a void, and we need to, to look at models, at existing models, for, for what kind what are the ways in which we can begin to live Jewish lives that are not necessarily orthodox? Other questions? Yes, um, there's a microphone right next to you, right there. Uh, on the table? Can somebody hand it over. Thanks, Alan. My wife's a... Uh, is, is it on? We can get you a different one. It's on. Is it on? Yeah, you just have to hold it close. Yeah. My wife's a psychotherapist, and when we have an argument, she says, I should understand the problem. And I'm a physician, and when we have an argument, I say we should fix the problem. It, it sounds like both speakers are saying we should understand the problem. But wouldn't David Hartman say we should fix the problem? <laughs> Yossi says it's my turn. Um, absolutely. Um, to the extent that I can attest to what I believe David Hartman would say, he would absolutely say 
that there's a need to fix the problem. Um, and as I said, as one of my concluding remarks, there is an ethics, there is a, 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 a route of engagement for my North American Christian community um, in its role in trying to fix the problem. What we've been working on thus far and what I was asked to present and therefore tried to present was a new framework in which to ask the question, how do we fix the problem? Because each one of those narratives that I suggested we have already in North American Christianity um, and more are all well packaged. You can pick them up on the shelf at your local supermarket and they all come with solutions. Um, most of those solutions have not availed very effectively. And one can do a whole analysis of what the sh respective shortcomings are um, in terms of trying to reach some kind of fixing of the problem. Um, simply choosing one of those then um, doesn't seem to be an effective way to mobilize fixing the problem. And therefore, this effort is to frame a different way of understanding the problem. Um, there are things in what I said this evening that would anger and alienate just about everybody I know in the North American Christian community one way or another. Um, it's designed that way because it's an attempt to embrace and reckon with the remarkable complexity that exists within Israel and in the region. And I think until we can get people who are willing to come to this issue, this situation, with an honest recognition of that complexity and the kind of multilateral solidarity that I've suggested our scriptures and our faith call us to, um, I'm not really interested in talking about their solutions. Um, I, I've seen enough of them and I'm not convinced. So come on back next year. We're likely to be a little further down the road. We might be ready to start talking about how to fix it. But before we wanna ask people to think about how to fix it, we're really concerned. I'm afraid I side with your wife on this one. If you wanna fix it, it helps if you understand it well first. Now the hands are starting to come up. Okay, um, let's take let's take th the three the three question um, people and then okay and we'll write things down. Okay, so we'll start over here. Yeah. Thanks. Hi to Yossi. Um, I really appreciated the uh, the picture you painted of uh, Israel diaspora Jewish relations. Um, in particular, I appreciated the um, the suggestion that um, that each body take on um, a sense of narrative from the other um, that you described. Um, that essentially diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews need to hold plural narratives in their minds. Um, just coming from a world of uh, working in this country with interfaith relations, I'm just wondering if your if your vision which is lucid and complex um can does it boil down to the same to the old chestnut of um the cognitive problem how can you ask people to hold such a complex position in their minds in other words how can they take how can they hold a a dual position without faltering to either or Yeah, there were two hands up in the back. Um, first, yeah, um, the young man with the jacket on. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> the, uh, the type of conversation that was sort of promoted seemed to be a lot about, um, about, na about a narrative conversation, identity conversation, their histories. Um, what, something that Daniil Hartman and Abhi Sagi spoke about here a few weeks ago was the sort of parallel conversation that seems to be dominating, which is a conversation of 
more of a legal in legal terms of rights and duties and self-determination, and that sort of avoids dealing with the narratives. I wanted to know if you think that that sort of parallel type of discourse is something that's obstructive to, uh, to seeking solutions, or if there's a way that that conversation can be integrated with the conversation that's more about narrative and identity. Okay. Um, and I saw Kurt right in the back. Thanks so much, Yossi and, and Peter. This was just immensely helpful. As someone who has been coming every year to Hartman for over a decade uh, and doing Abrahamic uh, conversation for nearly 20 years in both academic and religious settings, uh, I think it's, it's eminently at this point over the 60 years and, and going of the Israeli national identity really to think about lessons from America. Um, democracy is a moving target. It is, an, it is an always an unfinished project. So a solution is sort of what's happening this year. Um, I really appreciate the comments about secularity. It must be remembered that there is a way to be religiously secular as well as to be irreligiously and somewhere in the middle secular. Uh, all the three faiths have ultra-orthodox problems and orthodox problems across you know, various more narrow spectrums. These are big challenges. Israel happens to have a, a Jewish majority. Uh, US and Canada have a Christian majority. Uh, the, the smaller mi minorities are Christian, Druze, and so on. And so there's a, th th these things will not go away. Uh, the, the Muslim uh, texts even testify, maybe for our sakes as Jews and Christians, God willed that we would not be the same, uh, that we would compete in righteousness. Uh, and I, I would say the, Jew the, the Christian and Jewish addendum is we would deal in judgment that does not lead to death. Which was Peter's, I think, the, the Jesus text in Nazareth. We have some dear, dear Christian friends today who are old, from old, old Christian families in Nazareth. Uh, whatever the judgment, let it not lead to death. Um, we are in a country that is profoundly indebted to American Jews and Christians, and for the foreseeable future, will be profoundly indebted to American Jews and Christians. And it, it is as it should be in the community of nations. Is, is there a question? So my question is, <laughs> my question is, um, can we formulate, let's say, I, I think one of the best representatives from the Jewish perspective of religious democracy right now is a Tel Avivan in University of Toronto, Ron Herschel. Uh, his great work in political philosophy, uh, theocratic constitutionalism, where we need, to, we need to move in a way that is very self-consciously religious, while at the same time uh, very self-consciously secular. And can we do that in Israel? Uh, I hope that we can, as well as we have done it uh, as a moving target, as, an, uh, as a forever unfinished project in America and other democracies where religious, uh, religious, large religious populations are very prominent and dominant. Okay. Um, okay, we have two furious writers here. <laughs> but I'm going to turn to Yassi first. OK, the, uh, the first question was, uh, if, I understood, if I understood you correctly, you were really asking about the capacity for empathy, whether that's, whether that's too much to ask. And I think that the, the, my goal, and, and really the goal of our, of our seminar on engaging Israel is, is, is not civility. Civility is the starting point. The goal is to begin a process 
where we internalize each other's values, anxieties, insights. You know, different, different Jewish communities have, uh, in a sense, learned, um, acquired certain insights through, through their wanderings in history. And, and we need to listen to, to the wisdom and, and the fears of these different communities. And, and um, so for me, the, the, the question really is not, um, do, we, do, we, do we aim for civility? It's more a, how do we begin a process where, where we shift from being a community of one-dimensional Jews who are able to hold a single insight about our dilemmas and become, in a sense, multi-dimensional dimensional Jews, that we become a little bit left and a little bit right at the same time. And, and I think that many Israelis today are really moving toward that more nuanced understanding of our predicaments here. And, and if you look at, uh, at what the polls consistently show, 70 plus percent of Israelis want a two-state solution and, and understand that the occupation is a disaster for us. And in that sense, a majority of Israelis have internalized the argument of the Israeli left. At the same time, when you ask Israelis, do you believe that a two-state solution will bring peace, over 80% say no. And there they've internalized the warnings of the Israeli right about the dangers of a, of a of a delusion, of a, of a delusionary peace process. So most Israelis today agree with the left on the, on the occupation, but are wary with the right of, of, a, uh, of, a false, of a false peace. And that's an example, I think, of the kind of nuanced Jewish persona that I, I would hope we would be uh, working toward in, uh, in creating and engaging Israel. Thank you. Um, I want to start by responding to the question about the legal rights discourse and, uh, and its place um, in this, uh, whether it, it helps or hinders um, dealing with the, the whole situation. Um, I, I, in, the, in the discourse that I hear in North America, there's a prior question to that. Um, and it has to do with the legitimacy of those who would be engaged in the discourse of rights and, uh, and legal standing. Um, we have a, a reasonably strong uh, voice in the, um, in the uh, North American Christian Zionist community, um, which effectively um, elides Palestinian life from the region and from the, from the land um, and, and doesn't accord it the legitimacy of um, belonging. Um, and similarly, we have a fairly active, um, and I, I think it's fair to say over the last decade or so, growing um, movement, particularly among the mainline Protestant churches, um, which is engaging increasingly in advocacy that looks like delegitimizing Israel um, and that uh, is, is advocating um, steps that would potentially hasten the day of the existential crisis that, that uh, uh, external crisis that Yossi has sketched for us this evening. So I think until we have a way to talk about affirming the uh, presence and the dignity of those who would be engaged in rights discourse. Um, the religious community is not going to be particularly effective. There certainly can be uh, uh, a secularly based uh, post-enlightenment Western liberal tradition uh, based discourse on rights and uh, and and the legal standing, um, the the you know the the Christian Church doesn't need to 
give legitimacy to that process. It exists, it's there. Um, it also hasn't seemed to be getting us very far, at least for the, fa for the past couple of decades. Um, and, and it's not, I don't, it, I'm not competent to address how that might be, be moved forward. Um, but so I think a first step for us within the Christian community is to get at an articulation of the legitimacy of the parties. Um, I think the next step then, you know, would be for us to reflect on just how exactly religious communities in uh, conflict situations and in national polities um, have influence in the legal and rights discourses of their countries. Um, I think we might have used to, it, it might be that we used to do that better in uh, the United States than we have in the last uh, 10 years or so, but um, who knows, maybe this is all just growing pain still. Um, then at that point, I think the next thing that one does is to identify the religious values that one brings to the situation if one is in a religious community. And a particular example that we've worked with in the early materials as we've developed uh, new paths um, is to recognize, and Yossi made reference to this, um, that there are profound fears that in some ways underlie and motivate um, behavior and attitudes um, both in the Israeli community and in the Palestinian community. Um, and in both communities there are real fears um, and in both communities there are probably fears that our psychiatrist, psychologist would suggest she could deal with better than tanks and airplanes could. Um, but the fact is they're fears and they're really felt. And at that point, one of the questions that the Christian community outside this immediate arena has to ask is, how do we engage in a conflict that is deeply grounded in mutual mortal fear? And what are the religious values that we bring to that? Um, for me, it suggests that at the very least, we should not do anything in the situation, in encountering the situation, in moving into the situation that would increase the fear on either side. Um, that that is flat out counterproductive. And so we at least have a negative test of any engagement that we might consider. And that is, does it, in, does it ratchet up the fear? And if it doesn't, then keep thinking. I hope that's somewhat helpful to uh, respond to your question. Um, Kurt, I, I actually have to answer your question with a question because I, at some point, we don't have to do it right now. Um, we have opportunity the next couple of days, certainly, but um, I want to hear more about somebody who is um, deeply religious, who's taking an approach that is deeply religious and deeply secular. Um, you've just um, jumbled my uh, intellectual categories, so um, I need to learn more about that. Okay. Um, I think, yes, you wanted to speak for a moment to something that Kurt said, and then we'll open up for one more round of questions. Yeah, I wanted to, to uh, relate as well to the, the, uh, the question you raised of, uh, can we be both religious and secular at the same time? And pick up on something that you just said, Peter, which is the, um, the emphasis on religious values. And, and our challenge here, one of our challenges, is to, is to separate or, or st rather strengthen religious values and weaken religious official institutions. And there seems to be a direct relationship between the stronger the religious institutions on an official level, the weaker the religious values. And the, the challenge for, for, for Israel as a, as a country that was founded by a secular movement with deep religious resonance is, is how do we navigate the, the existence of Israel as a secular state in a holy land. And the, the, you know, the, the seminal moment, I think, where, where Zionism defined, defined its, its fate or destiny was when it rejected uh, the British proposal to create a Jewish state in Uganda, which Herzl 
as a desperate move was promoting, and insisted, no, it has to be here. And, and by insisting on, on this land, uh, Zionism really condemned us to, the, the, to a state of permanent ambivalence between secularism and, and, um, and religiosity. And it would, have, it would have been far simpler to create a, a Jewish state in a land without any religious uh, resonances. So the, um, the, the other, the other um, point I think that, that's, that came to mind when, when I was listening to you was the, the, that seminal moment when the elders of Israel confronted Samuel the prophet and said, um, anoint us, anoint us, anoint the king over us so we will be a nation like all other nations. And Samuel, of course, is exasperated and he says, why, why would Israel want to be like the other nations? You're being led by, by, by prophets who have direct access to God. And God, of course, says, well, give them what they want. And, and there is, a, in that confrontation, something that's, that's deeply true for, for us today. What is it that we want? What is it that Zionism wanted? Did it want to be a nation like all other nations? Did it want to be an exceptional nation? Thinking back to, to uh, what you spoke about in your presentation, the, quest, the sense of calling. And Jews have, have, have uh, embraced that calling and at the same time tried to flee from that calling throughout our history. That's largely what the biblical story is about, that struggle with trying to live in the impossible intimacy with God. And, and a sense of that, the, the biblical account is, is in, in many ways a story of that failure, the inability to live in that, 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 that relentless intimacy. And, and the, I think that the, the secular Zionist founders, some of whom were deeply messianic in, 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 in a secular way, but nevertheless uh, strongly shaped by, by by Messianic Judaism. How they, I believe, understood Ben-Gurion for sure, what this state should be, uh, would, was as a, a country that would be internally exceptional and externally normalized. And the situation that we, the state that we have today often seems to be the opposite of that. It seems at times to be almost painfully ordinary internally and externally to always be the exception in, in, in the international community. And uh, our goal here, I think, is to, in some sense, reverse that, that dynamic and, and return to something of what the original secular spiritual Zionist vision for this country was. Okay, just a few last questions. I saw Menachem had something. And if there's anyone else. Um, r rather than, I mean, there, there'll be a big question mark at the end, but rather <laughs> than a question, I, a, a very, very brief critique, Yossi. You, you characterized... Just speak closer. I say you, you, you characterized American Judaism as being, as often being shallow and wide, and, uh, and Israel offering a deep, yet dark and narrow... And I think you've committed both those. Uh, you, 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 you've read what you take to be the message from America too shallowly. And I think you're reading the message you're hearing from Israel too dark and narrow and deep. The message from America about the strangers is not, do not be brutal. That's trivial and immediate. Ka'izrach mimcha ye'ager hagar itcha a citizen like you shall be the stranger amongst you and you shall love him like yourself. This is about nation building. This is not about the Palestinian problem. This is about the nation building challenge of Israel, which is not a Jewish, commu Jewish landed community, but a nation in which strangers live. The, 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 the package coming from America quoting you know, that side of the Micha, Micha Goodman observation is far more profound and far more trying and, and challenging 
then do not be brutal. It's about creating civil society, which we're only beginning to do. That's the question I think your daughter Maria was asking you. Now, the dark and narrow reading of the Israeli message of the ex taking the external threat seriously, do not be naive, that again is trivial. Nobody should be naive. But each and every government in the past decades has been using the external threat to create solidarity and nationhood. That's wrong. That's wrong. So it, it's not about taking Iran seriously. It's about, it, 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 it's about defining the state of the nation by means of Iran and creating Jewish nationhood by the Amalek motive of the threat and therefore creating Israel as a fortress to protect and, and not a, a, a nation, a multicultural nation with, 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 with you know, a Jewish majority to be built. Now, now Micha Goodman is wrong. Those dreams have, I mean, they've been dreamt in so many words, but we do not have the vocabulary. We do not have the, 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 the Jewish vocabulary for nationhood. Okay, and this needs to be thought and created anew. America has a lot, American Jewry and America in general, Kurt, has a lot to teach us in that respect. But Israel has to get out of the Matsada Amalek uh, 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 fortress frame of mind of nation building on the basis of external threat without being naive. Okay. Uh, is there, wait, oh. yeah. I, I very much appreciate your point about the lack of a vocabulary and, uh, and, and really a world view that would sustain nation building, and, and, and I deeply disagree with your second point about, uh, about getting us out of the fortress mentality. I'd like to draw a distinction between the two. Uh, in terms of, uh, of embracing the stranger, I think it's a very important distinction you're making implicitly between Palestinians who are citizens of Israel and those who aren't. Palestinians who are citizens of Israel are part of our society. And the fact that on, on Israeli documents, when, uh, when, when you are asked to define nation, Israel is not a category. You have to put Jewish, Christian, Muslim on, on national identity. We do not have an Israeli all-embracing identity. And uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's indicative of the poverty of, uh, of Jewish national thinking. We've, and it's an expression of the fact that we have not been a, a sovereign nation for, uh, for, for the last centuries. And, um, and we've, made, we've made all the mistakes of a people that, that was conditioned to non-sovereignty. And we've imposed the thinking of the ghetto onto, onto sovereignty. There I agree with you. Where I disagree really very strongly is the notion that we, the poor citizens of Israel have been manipulated by our government into perceiving threat and into rallying around the flag. We, I believe that those threats are, are objectively real. Oh, I, I, and I, don't dis I, I don't contest that, but you don't form solidarity. You know, nation building cannot be built on, on the definition of the anti-Semite or the definition of the Amalek. Yes, I, I, I think it's, it's, it would be wrong to reduce the Israeli Jewish identity to, to a negative. I think that there are very deep sources of positive national identity. The problem is that it is Israeli Jewish, and we haven't yet figured out how to expand that to, uh, to Israeli, to creating spaces in which we could be Israelis together beyond our, our ethnic or narrow national identities. Okay, I think it's getting late, so let's call it a night. But thank you again, Yassi, and thank you, Peter, for giving us a lot to think about.